All right, here we go. Okay, so um, in the book, it, it, it just kind of broadly talks about upper respiratory infections, but doesn't really talk about specific examples. So I just want to cover some specific examples, um, and some of these are actually really common and not necessarily life-threatening, but it still helps that, that we know a little bit about them. So upper respiratory is generally going to be above the glottis is really what we talk about with upper respiratory. There is some crossover with some of these, but um, let's, let's go ahead and talk about them. So what's sinusitis? <clears throat> okay, sinuses, yeah. It right, can cause sinus pressure, and you have several different sinuses, right? You have lateral, maxillary, you have um, um, superior and inferior sinuses. Um, these infections can be viral, they can be bacterial, they can be fungal. Um, they can be painful, they can cause a lot of um, congestion, can even sometimes be associated with vertigo and dizziness. Generally not life-threatening unless there's some situation where it involves the meninges or penetrates into the, uh, the cranial cavity or cranial vault, and then you, end up, you can end up developing um, abscesses and meningitis and those, those kinds of things. Um, but there you go. Um, let's see, tonsillitis. What is that? Of the tonsils. I mean, you guys are all good at, at recognizing the tonsils because that's part of our, our um, lemon exam. Um, and again, tonsillitis can be viral. It can be bacterial. Um, strep, when we talk about bacterial, streptococcal um, species tend to be the, the most common bacterial problems associated with upper respiratory infections. Um, and untreated bacterial tonsillitis may develop into a disorder known as a peritonsillar abscess. And this is where you develop, an abscess is basically just a large pocket of pus that can develop. And so you can get a big pocket of pus that develops in one or, or both of your tonsils. And is that a potential problem? Yeah, what's the problem? Airway, yeah, airway obstruction, okay. So peritonsillar abscess, I've actually seen a couple of these in my career, um, can be potentially life-threatening. Um, there's not much we can do about them in the pre-hospital environment. Um, in, the, in the emergency room, we'll stick a needle in there and we'll drain it uh, with a needle um, as a temporary measure um, to make sure that the airway is, is preserved and uh, they can be quite quite smelly, actually, um, quite malodorous uh, when you're dealing with these. Um, if you have somebody with a, a peritonsillar abscess, basic airway management first. Um, first and foremost, don't, don't manipulate their airway if you can help it. Yeah, um, position of comfort, all that. But if they end up developing severe respiratory distress, you essentially would treat this like epiglottitis, right? Um, bag valve mask ventilations. Attempting to intubate them is going to be very, uh, very interesting um, and probably a, a therapeutic uh, misadventure to say the least. So I would, uh, I would, I would recommend you, you kind of uh, steer clear of that. And again, that's why it's important that when you're assessing somebody with respiratory complaints, you look in their throat and you notice these things. And if you see a large swollen area around their tonsil or you see deviation of structures where there's some sort of mass effect going on in there, you want to be very careful about manipulating the airway. Uh, what's pharyngitis? Of the pharynx, right, which may be associated with tonsillitis, okay, this is, or, or may not be, and um, again, this can be viral, this can be bacterial, you've heard of the term strep throat, quote unquote, okay. That, uh, that's a type of pharyngitis. What's laryngitis? Of uh, the larynx, right? Um, and these people can get cough, right? Cough, hoarse, right? Your vocal cords can be affected. Good. What's rhinitis? Of the nose, yeah. It's an inflammation or infection of the nose. Again, it can be viral. It can be due to allergies, irritation, ex environmental exposure, um, viral, bacterial, etc. What about epiglottitis? Uh, 
of the epiglottis. And epiglottitis is almost always bacterial, a bacterial infection. And what's the what big problem there? Airway compromise. Good, good. Okay. And again, if you have to aggressively manage the airway, I would recommend you not intubate or consider placing advanced airways. Stick with BLS maneuvers. You may off, you often can, can, with just a back valve mask, you, you might be able to ventilate those patients effectively and just stick with that. What could tell you that you're dealing with epiglottitis and peritonsal or abscess? Well, positioning, right? The patient in a tripod position. Are they are they drooling? Okay. Do they have uh, strider, unilateral wheezing, those kinds of things? Um, all pointing towards an, a, a partial obstruction plus signs and symptoms of an infection. Right? They get fever, chills, myalgia, malaise. Those those kinds of things. Cool. Now these are not upper airway per se. But I just want to mention them. It's otitis externa and otitis media. What is that? Ear infection. Ear infection. Externa is the outer, the outer ear. And then media is the, the middle ear. Yeah, so behind the eardrum, from basically the eardrum to, to the cochlea is the middle ear. Um, these are very common, and they're often associated... Otitis media is often associated with these guys up here, right? They, can, they tend to go together. Um, there's not much we can do about it as a pre-hospital provider, but if you have a patient that has complaints of vertigo or dizziness, this should be one of the things you want to consider, okay? In addition to, is there a neurological issue? Is there a cardiac issue? Okay, so you, you, do, you do your stroke assessment, you get a 12 lead on them, you do all that, but you also want to think, okay, could they have an ear infection? Um, it's a very common cause of, of uh, tinnitus, ringing in the ear, of vertigo, feeling dizzy, those kinds of things. Um, lateral sinus thrombosis is very rare, but it's, it's basically a, a thrombosis that develops, that, that goes from the ear and penetrates into the, um, the sinus cavity. can be life-threatening, but again, it's a pretty rare thing. Um, and we'll talk about, I think we have a, a, a whole lecture on ear, eyes, nose, and throat disorders a little later on, but I just wanted to throw that out there for you guys. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I do want to mention strep, okay, streptoco streptococcus. Uh, group A strep tends to be the one that we are most concerned about, okay. And... Um, what can develop in people that get strep is something called scarlatina. Have you guys ever heard of scarlatina? Mm -hmm. It's also known as scarlet fever. And it presents in somebody who has strep, okay, it presents with, as you might imagine, you look in the back of their throat, they tend to have, you know, little pussy spots, white, white spots in the back of their throat. And it can be very hard to differentiate it from other things, right? So things like, like thrush or oral candidiasis, May, may look like strep. So you don't necessarily need to be experts in this, but if somebody has a very high fever, malaise, chills, very sore throat, um, plus um, whatever visual findings you want to be thinking about strep. And with scarlet fever, um, you can get a, what they call a strep rash, or you get a red bumpy rash. And again, rashes are tough. Dermatology in general is just horrific because there's so many so many things going on, but if you have kind of this, this, this red um, raised rash all over or in certain parts of the body with all the other signs and symptoms of strep, you need to be thinking scarlet fever. Um, the good thing is scarlet fever is generally easy to treat with antibiotics, but untreated scarlet fever can lead to lots of problems. It can lead to blindness. It can lead to loss of hearing. It can lead to rheumatic heart fever, right? What is that? It's a bacterial infection in your valves. That's, yeah, that's where the strep actually colonizes your heart valves and causes them to become very stenotic and to fail, right? So, um, and it can cause <laughs> renal failure as well. Take your, uh, you can have an immune reaction and take your kidneys out. 
So um, scarlet fever is actually a very, um, very tough thing. And unfortunately, somebody can also develop what's called a viral rash, where they get red raised bumps due to having a viral infection. How do you tell that apart? How do you tell that from scarlet fever, necessarily? You don't. You seek expert consultation, right? You get the patient to where they need to go, and then they can do a rapid strep test on them and find out um, what's going on. So um, it's really hard to make that call because these things look very similar. So just take, you know, if you have this and you're, in, in, in you're concerned, you're not quite sure, just take them to where they need to go and get that ruled in and ruled out. You guys okay with that? Okay, cool. Let's now talk about lower airway um, infections, excluding pneumonia because we talked about pneumonia in some detail already. Um, so let's talk about the first one, bronchiolitis. And where, where does this affect? What area? The bronchioles. The bronchioles. Good. And a common name for bronchiolitis is RSV or a common cause. And what is RSV? should know this one because this is common in young kids that are, you know, less, less than a few years old. Very common in, the, in the, the late fall, winter months. And can potentially be life-threatening for kids. It's respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. It's a common cause of bronchiolitis in kids. RSV tends not to be as big of a deal in adult patients. It tends to present more like a cold or, you know, by the time you're adult, you've had it so many times that you tend to have lots of antibodies um, for it as well. But kids, it can be really tough, right? And the problem with, RS, with, bron with RSV is it's hard to treat, right? It's not like you can give them a bronchodilator because it, it, they may not have wheezing, right? It, you know, they just get all this inflammation, they get a really high fever, they get very dehydrated, they have respiratory distress, um, and so it can be really tough to treat them. And it's a virus, right? So it's, it's not like we have any, any, any antiviral therapies for this. That's, that's, there is something called ribavirin, but um, the evidence supporting its use is really pretty suspect. Um, so generally, what do we do? We have to let, them, let it run its course, right? Give them fluids. Um, if you've got a kid who's dehydrated, what is your standard fluid resuscitation? Good. 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus. Good. Okay, cool. What about acute bronchitis? That involves the, the bronchi, right? So the larger airways. And what is this? What do people that have acute bronchitis look like? Yeah, um, my two little sickos back there, right? <laughs> yeah, right. That's a, yeah, bronchitis. Um, acute bronchitis is generally viral. It is almost always a viral infection, um, and unfortunately, part of the 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 pickle that we found ourselves in with antibiotic uh, resistant organisms is we often over treat patients that have coughs sneezes, sniffles, and colds, um, what do we do? We put them on Zithromax and erythromycin, those kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've really done some, some harm there, unfortunately. Okay, um, and there's also tracheal laryngeal bronchitis, also known as croup. And this one has some crossover. Croup involves both the upper and lower airways. Um, it advises the trachea the larynx, and the bronchi. Um, and what do these patients classically present as? They have a croupy bark, right? That's a striderous bark due to um, inflammation um, in or around their glottis. Um, how do we treat them? Humidified oxygen if we can, okay. IV therapy, right? If they're dehydrated and just supportive care, really more than anything, it's just good supportive care. Um, is croup viral or bacterial? Almost always viral, yeah. Almost always viral. Good. Um, there's a, a more rare one due to vaccinations, but that is something known as pertussis or whooping cough. Okay, we've seen a, a reemergence of this 
in some areas of the country due to um, some of the anti-vaccine movements and some of the children not being vaccinated. Um, so it's something that you may run into possibly, but it's just a very, it presents very similar to like a bronchitis, except the coughing can be very severe, um, so severe that you can have uh, damage occur due to this coughing. And they tend to have what are known as paroxysms of coughing or, or quote unquote fits of coughing where you know, they'll just have this really nasty episode of just terrible coughing that can last for a few minutes and then it'll go away and then it'll hit them all of a sudden again. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, something to think about. And then finally, um, I also just want to mention influenza and I'm going to talk about influenza in a little bit of detail um, here in just a little bit, but I do want you guys to be familiar with it. So influenza, is it a virus or bacteria? It's a virus, and it's actually several types of viruses, okay? It's not just one, one um, species. It's, it's, it's several different species and even a couple different genuses of, of vir viruses. Um, but um, we have three major types of influenza, okay? We, we call them type A, B, and C. So type A, type B, and type C, okay? And, and the way to think about this is... The type of influenza is kind of how it presents. Um, more specifically, there are proteins on the surface, and there, there, there are certain genes that we use to differentiate type A from B from C, but the, the practical um, differentiations has to do with how the patients are affected. So in general, type A and type B influenza tends to prevent with more severe symptoms, okay? So these are more concerning. Um, type C influenza tends to be much more mild and may actually present as a cold or like a bronchitis. Um, and you may not even know that you've had the flu um, because it, it tends to be so mild. So we're not as worried about type C. It's type A and B that tends to cause lots of the problems. Okay, Type A in particular is the one that can cause pandemics, and I'll talk about why that is in just a, in just a few minutes. Okay, Type A and B tend to mutate much more. Okay, They tend to, be, they tend to mutate um, a lot faster. Okay? But type B is the only one found in humans exclusively. Okay? Or type C, rather. Excuse me. Oops, typo, type C, yeah. Um, even though it's mild, it tends to be exclusive to human beings. Okay, so A and B are the, the big baddies. A in particular is the one that tends to cause widespread pandemics. You guys, you guys okay with that so far? All right, cool. Um, uh, I just put a note here to review a wheezing, but that came up in the quiz, and it sounds like you guys are all over it, where with an asthma patient... Sometimes wheezing going away can be a bad thing, right? Yeah. right? Somebody's wheezing and you're treating them and then you listen to their chest and you don't hear anything, that may very well be a patient who's getting worse, right? Going into that, that silent chest. And sometimes wheezing is a good thing, right? <clears throat> if you hear somebody and you, and you listen to them and they just have a slight wheezing and then you, you're treating them and all of a sudden their wheezing gets much worse, that might indicate they're getting better, right? You're actually getting some airflow, yeah. So not all wheezing is the same, and it just needs to be taken into context with the overall assessment and how the patient was doing versus how they're currently doing. And then remember, uh, COPD, anybody who has obstructive pathology, um, bronchospasm, um, oxygen first, right? Rescue drugs, fluids, steroids, Epinephrine, okay, if they develop status, and then um, more, and then we go into our, our second line therapies like mag sulfate, theophylline or aminophylline, and possibly even um, uh, heliox, which is something that we don't necessarily have access to. Okay, cool. So let's influenza business here. Okay, so type A. So type A influenza 
is the most common. Many, 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 many different subtypes. Actually, uh, at least 170 different subtypes of influenza A. Um, there's so many different subtypes of type A influenza that we have an a, what we call the HN naming system, and I'll talk about what that means. And this thing can mutate very rapidly and markedly. Okay. And then your type B and type C are um, less common um, and uh, less severe and less mutogenic. Um, type C being the, less of, the least severe and the least mutogenic. So before we talk about the naming and all that, let's just talk about signs and symptoms. What, what differentiates the flu from uh, an, a run-of-the-mill viral upper respiratory infection, or URI? Yeah, so with, a, with the flu, you get two different types of symptoms, signs and symptoms. You get specific and what we call constitutional. And constitutional is just another word that means systemic, okay? A systemic sign or symptom. So you get respiratory-specific signs and symptoms, okay? You get congestion and rhinorrhea, sore throat, cough, etc., right? Your typical URI stuff. But in addition to that, you get systemic or constitutional signs and symptoms, such as fever, chills, myalgia, and fatigue, okay? So if you have respiratory specific signs and symptoms plus constitutional signs and symptoms, okay, um, that is evidence for influenza. Does that, that kind of make sense? That differentiates it at points more toward the direction of influenza. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control says that if somebody has a sore throat or cough and fever, they are said to have an influenza-like illness or an ILI doesn't mean they have the influenza necessarily, but they have an illness that is presenting like influenza. You guys okay with that so far? Good. Okay, so a cold, a quote-unquote cold, your run-of-the-mill upper respiratory infection, tends to present with respiratory symptoms, but not much in the way of constitutional symptoms, like a, a fever, severe chills, fatigue, those kinds of things. Um, influenza also tends to have an abrupt onset. It tends to start suddenly within about one to two days. Most people that get to the flu can tell you exactly when they started feeling ill. It wasn't like, oh, I've been having a cough for two months or a week. You know, it's not that kind of complaint. It's a very, very acute onset. And the duration of the flu tends to be about a week. So in about three to seven days, they tend to get better, okay? So it's a quick on and a relatively short um, duration of action, if, if you will. You guys okay with that? Okay, so let's now talk about the naming structure of the flu. And the way that this works is when you look at a, the influenza virus, it, it really just comes down to two things. There's an envelope, okay? So it's basically a a carbohydrate and protein envelope, a shell, if you will, that surrounds genetic material. And that's really all a virus is, um, is it's a shell, a protein and carbohydrate shell that surrounds genetic material. You guys okay with that? And so it's kind of like a preloaded syringe. That's what a virus is like. It's a preloaded syringe that when it bumps and when it attaches to the right cell, the syringe activates and it ejects the genetic material into the cell. And then that genetic material reprograms the cell. And what does the cell do? It makes more viruses. And then those viruses eventually kill, the cell dies and then it ruptures and those viruses are released. So here's an interesting question. Is a virus live is it is it considered alive or is it considered dead or what 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 is a virus it's not alive what do you think it has no um, like functioning organelles 
create no organelles. It does not create its own energy. So there, yeah, there are no metabolic processes occurring. So is it alive or is it dead? Or, 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 or inanimate? Inanimate. Inanimate material. Well, when they say live, they mean it they just mean active. yeah, they mean that it's 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 it, it has a triggering mechanism, not that it, there's any metabolism going on inside of it or anything like that necessarily. Interestingly enough, the best way that I've found to look at this dilemma is to look at a virus as something with two cycles, and this is what make what makes viruses so weird. The first cycle is an inanimate cycle where it's just the virus particle, and it's just a particle. But when that particle attaches to a cell and injects its RNA into the cell, that's life, right? That is undoubtedly a living organism, right? So the infected cell is the living cycle of a virus, and the inanimate particle is an inanimate cycle of the virus. So I look at it as something that has two cycles, an a, a, um, inanimate or non-living cycle and a living cycle. Does that kind of make sense? And then when the cell ruptures and dies and releases all the, the virus particles, well, they're inanimate again, and then rinse and repeat. Does that kind of make sense? Um, it's weird. It's weird that way, but, you know, there's a lot of, so much gray. Um, okay, so the way that the, the virus works is um, there are two major proteins on the surface of the virus, and now these are obviously are just cartoons that I drew. <laughs> um, that's not what they literally look like. But you have what are called hemagglutin proteins, and I think of hemagglutin proteins as being like little hands. And what they do is they grab a hold of something known as sialic acid. And sialic acid is a, um, is a molecule that exists on the surface of respiratory cells. And so what happens is the hemagglutin proteins have the right shape where they can grab a hold of that sialic acid and they can grab a hold of the respiratory cells. Does that make sense? And so that's the hemagglutin protein. And then there's another protein, which is actually an enzyme, called uh, neuraminidase. And neuraminidase is, and I, I drew a, a hand with a knife in it. Okay, so hemagglutin is like a hand, HH, right? And neura, neuraminidase is like a, um, like a nicking. Think of nicking with a knife. Okay, so the hands grab a hold, and then the neuraminidase makes that nick, right, and cuts in. And then that allows the, the virus to inject its genetic material into the cell. Does that make sense? So you have your hemagglutin proteins, and you have your neuraminidase proteins, right? And these proteins have different structures. They can vary. And by looking at that structure, we can differentiate individual influenza type A viruses. And so have you guys ever heard of H1N1, for example? Right? That's a type of influenza A. And all that means is that they have hemagglutin 1 and neuraminidase 1. Right? Does that make sense? They have one type. Um, and there are 17 different types of hemagglutin proteins. 17, and about 10 different types of neuraminidase proteins. So if you multiply those together, that's 170 different subtypes of viruses, right? H, H2N5, you know, whatever. Um, there are 170 different permutations that, that can exist. And so H1N1 would be one example of that. Does that kind of make sense there? You don't have to know what the subtypes do and all that, but that's where that naming comes from. You guys, you guys okay with that? So far, so good? Cool. Now, um, also, the influenza virus does not contain DNA. It contains RNA, and that's very important. It'll be very important here in a few minutes.
okay? And type A and B contain eight strands of RNA, whereas type C only contains seven strands of RNA. Okay. So these are these are considered RNA viruses, which is is a little interesting, as we'll soon find out. Okay. So why does influenza A mutate? What's going on? Well, there are two major processes that go on. There's something known as genetic drift and genetic shift. Some people call this antigen drift and antigen shift. Okay, so remember what I said about the influenza virus. It contains RNA, right? Well, interesting thing about RNA is, are there robust mechanisms for correcting errors in replication of RNA? No. no. There are robust mechanisms for DNA, right? For repairing DNA mutations in our cells, but not RNA, because basically by the time you get to RNA, all that should be taken care of, right? Because what is the central dogma of molecular biology, going back to pathophysiology? What's the central dogma of molecular biology? DNA is copied into RNA, right? So the, the, in that, you have your inherent um, corrective mechanisms there, but RNA is turned into proteins, right? So there is really no, no corrective mutation um, process from, from RNA to proteins. So if a mutation of the RNA happens, then it just codes for whatever protein it codes, defective or not. Does that make sense? So what happens is when the virus injects its RNA into the cell, the RNA simply hijacks the ribosome mechanisms of the cell, right? And the RNA is coded, in, in, in co it's copied and coded into the proteins. And so what happens is um, copying is like 99.9 something percent efficient, okay? Except, yeah. So you're always going to get a couple of mutations. So what happens is over time, so I have a genetic change as a, uh, plotted as a function of time. Over time, when that virus infects your cell here, over time, okay, small mutations accumulate. And these small mutations naturally occur because there aren't those corrective mechanisms that, that in place for RNA. And so what happens is over time you can get this drift of genes that occur and these little mutations and that can cause the virus to change ever so slightly. Does that make sense? So I could get the flu and then over the course of my infection that flu may mutate just a little bit and then maybe I infect somebody else with this mutated form of the flu, and it affects them a little differently. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. But we can also have these huge... So here I have genetic mutation as a function of time. And what do you notice here? So I have a little bit of, of drift, but what's this going on here? That's a huge change, right? And so what can happen here is... Um, in genetic drift, you can get infected by two different types. Two different viruses infect the same cell. And then what happens? Well, their RNA gets jumbled within that cell, right? And when you have that jumbling of, of, of RNA, sometimes what will happen is a new virus can be produced, right? You, so you get this, so you have the vi you know, two viruses infect the same cell, their RNA gets jumbled, and you have a huge shift in genes, and you essentially have a new virus that's created, right? A new flu virus pops out, right? And this is what can lead to pandemics because these new viruses are unrecognized by the body, right? This is a new virus, new genetic material, new genetic markers, and so your body is basically starting from step one in trying to, attempting to fight this virus.
And so this can lead to, you know, pandemics of, of flu that mutates suddenly, becomes much more virulent, okay, that is, you know, much more infective and uh, much more, more deadly. You guys, you guys okay with that? Um, what tends to kill people with flu? What do they tend to die of? Is it the, necessarily the <laughs> flu that kills them? Yeah. It's the opportunistic infections that develop. So if you get a bad case of the flu, that flu damages your airways, compromises your immune system, and makes you prone to developing things like pneumonia. So a lot of people with the flu die from pneumonia. Now, the pneumonia, the, the flu does not cause, the virus does not cause pneumonia. It's the bacteria generally, right? But the flu ravages your body and makes you more prone to getting the pneumonia that, that ultimately goes on to kill you. Now, some people with the flu will die from, you know, maybe they'll get a real high fever and they'll, they'll go into multi-organ failure. They'll, they'll develop ARDS from the acute lung injury. From There are some people, but a lot of people also die as a result of an opportunistic infection. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So how do we manage somebody if we have a flu-like illness presentation? How, how do we manage them? What's that? Okay, so supportive care, right? Um, what about isolation? Right? How about protecting ourselves? What additional steps should we take to protect ourselves? What kind of mask? An N95? With a HEPA, okay, a high efficiency particulate, okay, good. Um, how about um, droplet, general droplet precautions, right? Yes. So probably eye protection as well, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course gloves. And what is one of the most important things we can do to prevent? Wash, wash. wash your hands. You guys are all over it. Okay, cool. Now managing them is going to be symptomatic, right? Supportive care. IV fluids, okay, if you're talking kids, um, we can give Tylenol for fever, okay, in the state of New Mexico, we can't do that for adult patients, go figure, but there you go, all right. Beta agonists, do you think they're going to be helpful here? No. Maybe. They if might. If there's wheezing. If there's wheezing, yeah. So... If there are signs and symptoms of airway obstruction, obstructive pathology, you can go ahead and give them. But, you know, if they don't have that, then um, albuterol, Zopinex, rescue drugs probably aren't going to be all that helpful. There is antiviral therapy out, things like Tamiflu. Um, its effectiveness is, there's some debate there. But generally speaking, if you can start it soon enough, um, it may help some patients, may help decrease the severity, may help increase or decrease the amount of time that you're actually sick by a couple days on the average. Um, again, there, there's a lot of discussion to be had around antiviral therapy, but it is out there. Um, can you test for flu? Is flu easy to test for? In the hospital? Yes, very easy to test for in the hospital. It's a swab. And, and, and within minutes, you can, you can tell somebody has particularly A, type A and B influenza. Um, RSV is another one that's easy to, to test for. We do a nasal wash. You squirt saline into the nose, and then you suck it back out. And um, you can get a positive or negative RSV test. A strep. To identify strep is uh, something called a rapid strep test. Um, again, it's a throat swab. And within about five minutes, um, you'll get an anti antigen, uh, an antibody antigen um, reaction in the lab that that's fairly reliable. Now, when it comes to like identifying like H two N three or whatever, that takes something called PCR. Are you guys familiar with what PCR is? What is PCR? I want you to be familiar with it even. Jeremy? Patient care report? Yeah, PC, patient care report, right? PCR is one of the most helpful techniques for identifying stuff. And it stands for polymerase 
chain reaction. Okay, it's called a PCR probe. Basically, it's a technique that uses an enzyme called DNA or uh, DNA or RNA polymerase. Okay, and what's a polymer? It's a bunch of monomers. Yeah, it's a bunch of so a, a monomer is just like one molecule. A polymer is a big long line of those molecules connected. So what we do is. If there is something that has genetic material in it, like a virus or a bacteria or just any cell, we can break that cell up and get at its genetic material, its DNA or its RNA, and then we can use this PCR probe to copy all of that genetic material. And you copy it many, many thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of times until you get a large amount of that genetic material, right? So you copy, even if you start with just a tiny amount, you copy it, copy, you get a large amount of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what PCR does. It allows you to copy lots of genetic material. And then what we can do is we take that genetic material and we do what's known as an electrophoresis. Have you guys ever heard of electrophoresis? Mm -hmm. So you basically inject that genetic material into a block of gel and then you put electrical current through that gel. And what happens is that the, um, the nucleotides have charges on them. Different, char the de different genes have different charges on them, depending on you know, the side chains and all that. And so some are pushed away from, right? With, if you put an electric potential across something, you have lots of negative on one side, lots of positive on the other. And they're kind of pushed away from the negative side, right? And the heavier genes don't move as much as the lighter genes, right? And so they spread out and they create these little lines in the gel. And every organism has a different set of lines that it produces. And that, so it's the PCR probe and the electrophoresis. Um, and there are different types. There's like a western blot um, and an eastern blot, and you can actually do it with electrophoresis of proteins, which may be a western blot. But anyway, it's the same thing. But um, with those two techniques, that allows you to genetically categorize and identify organisms. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally useless knowledge in some sense, but it's still, um, I mean, these, these, these are techniques that have just heralded, um, you know, modern contemporary biomedical science. So there you go. Okay. Um, also, guys, you should note that there are lots of um, organisms that uh, can mimic the flu, like the rhinovirus is one, um, which causes colds. <laughs> um, but uh, coronavirus is another one that can present with flu. Um, MERS, are you guys familiar with something called MERS? It's a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome is a very severe flu-like illness. It's not actually influenza, but it is a coronavirus that causes it. So there are lots of different viruses out there that can cause flu-like symptoms as well. Okay, good with that? Mm -hmm. All right, moving right along. Um, let's stop here, actually.